Thanks, Dietrich. So um, I want to talk about uh, what we're calling the information ecosystem. Uh, and I want to start by uh, reminding everybody that uh, we live in an epidemic of fake news. And so this is a, uh, just a simple count uh, from Google Trends uh, where you can see that uh, something happened in, uh, towards the end of 2016 uh, that surprised uh, many people. Uh, and very shortly afterwards, uh, everybody started talking about fake news, uh, and they really haven't stopped. Um, so uh, just a uh, simple counting of, of published papers since the beginning of 2017, there have been over 1,100 English language papers that contain the exact phrase fake news uh, in their titles. Uh, and if you think this is some sort of uh, continuation of a long-running trend, in all the years leading up to 20, uh, the end of 2016, only 66 such papers were published. Uh, and to put it in further context, uh, only about 300 papers were published that mentioned television news or TV news. So there's clearly an enormous focus uh, in the uh, academic uh, research literature on this topic. Uh, we, it's uh, also the case that uh, in the journalism world, there is enormous focus on it. Uh, there was a paper in 2016 uh, by uh, Craig Silverman at BuzzFeed that is cited by just about everybody who writes about fake news uh, that found uh, that the 20 most uh, popular story, fake news stories on Facebook had more total engagement than the 20 uh, most popular uh, legitimate news stories. So this was a fact that, uh, that also uh, became uh, ubiquitous. Uh, we have uh, numerous uh, uh, papers published in, in high-profile journals that have received lots of attention that, that make this point um, over and over again. The <clears throat> question that I want to ask here is, are we doing the thing where, uh, you know, the drunk is looking under the street lamp and the guy walking down the road says, you know, what are you doing? And he says, I'm looking for my keys. And the guy says, well, where did you drop them? And he says, over there by the door. Uh, and he said, well, why are you looking under the street lamp? And he said, well, that's where the light is. Uh, and I wonder if that's what we're doing with fake news, that everybody has uh, decided that fake news is this huge problem. And so when you go look and you find fake news, it looks terrible. There's lots of it. Um, uh, and uh, we, we, we want to get rid of it. And so then we come up with all sorts of strategies for how to deal with it, how to change people's minds, how to you know, algorithmically uh, uh, suppress it. Um, but really what we should do is step back and ask ourselves, where are the keys? Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, there's a couple of very simple uh, versions of that. One is, you know, there's lots of news, right? And fake news is some of that. So what portion of all the news is fake news? And what portion of everything that people are encountering that could potentially influence their opinions about various things uh, is, is news of any kind, right? I mean, all of us here, I think, read a lot of news and we're absorbed in news and we're all on Twitter and we're all sort of concerned with social media. And so we just kind of project uh, that everybody in the world is doing the same thing as us. But uh, that isn't necessarily true. And in fact, it turns out it isn't true uh, that uh, our sample, uh, our uh, impression of the world could be very misleading. And so we need to really take a, a, a data-driven look at the whole information ecosystem, not just online, but also on television, and ask ourselves, you know, where is the big chunk of everything, right? And, and how big of a chunk is fake news? So it's a very simple question. It turns out it's really hard to answer this question, hence the streetlight metaphor, because nobody collects this kind of data. Right? Nobody collects sort of everything. Like, what is everybody looking at uh, on television, online, on mobile devices? Uh, there is no single source of such data. Uh, it's very hard to get. Uh, we have been fortunate to work with Nielsen, uh, who have given us three separate panels, which they don't even integrate, right? Because they use them for separate things, and they have different clients who ask them different questions. So this is not a question that they have tried to answer themselves. Uh, but they have the nationally uh, a very a very good uh, you know this is the panel that is used every year to uh, uh, to uh, price uh, advertisements television advertisements so this is uh, sort of the gold standard of, of measuring uh, uh, national TV uh, they have a local TV version they also have an online desktop panel uh, but it doesn't track mobile content which of course we think is important and so we have a separate panel from Comscore that does that so. I'm glossing over lots of details here. This is about two years' worth of work, just putting this together. Um, so what do we learn? Well, so here is just sort of the, the first cut. Uh, this is 36 months uh, of data from the beginning of 2016 uh, to the end of 2018. 
uh, and it shows uh, this is uh, people watching stuff on TV that is not news related. This is people consuming stuff on mobile devices that is not news related. Uh, this is people uh, uh, consuming stuff on their desktop computers that is not news related. I haven't mentioned news so far at all. Um, that's like 300 minutes a day of uh, not news. Um, and then the red bar here is people watching news on TV. So TV news shows up, right? That's a fair bit of consumption. Every, those 1140 papers that study things happening online are all in these two little narrow bars here, the purple and the brown, which is regular news uh, online. Okay, and you can sort of see them here right around the 2016 election where indeed there was an uptick in people consuming online news, uh, but for most of this time period, it's very hard to see. We actually have plotted fake news on this picture, but you can't see it. It is invisible to the naked eye, okay? So how does this break down by age groups? You might say, well, it's true on average, but what about older people? What about younger people? So we see some differences here that are consistent with your intuition that older people watch more television. They watch a lot more television news in particular. Younger people don't consume news at all. Um, uh, they do a lot of other stuff, uh, but uh, the only thing that you can see here is a little, they watch a little bit of TV news, uh, and that's about it. Uh, but in both cases, you cannot see the fake news still. So we'll keep going. Uh, this shows, this is just for desktop data. We have a, a subset of the Nielsen panels where we have both online and about 25,000 people, where we have both their online consumption and their TV news consumption. So at the individual level, we can compare uh, uh, you know, how they consume both online and TV, because you might think that there are substitutes for each other, that the more online stuff you do, the less TV stuff you do. But in fact, we find that they're complements, that people just who consume more online uh, consume more TV, and there's a very nice uh, 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 correlation here. But I want to focus on this uh, dot down here, which is where the mass of the data is. 57% uh, of our respondents consume zero online news. Okay, so this is very inconsistent with my experience of the web and probably yours, but this is what the bulk of Americans are doing. Whatever they're doing, they're not consuming news at all. Uh, so what is the not news bit? What are they doing? Well, they're doing lots of different things. And when you look at this data, it all makes sense. People focus on entertainment, they go on social media, they watch dramas, uh, hear the news uh, does show up as the second most popular thing on television. So news on television is a real thing. Right? I think this is sort of, you know, if, the, if you sort of take away one uh, point from this presentation, is that if you talk about news, you have to be talking about television, right? If you're not talking about television, you're missing the bulk of everything that people are being exposed to. Uh, this is online news down here. So there's a number of different categories that are way more prevalent than news. Uh, and then finally, uh, Let's just say, okay, I don't care about all that other stuff. I don't care about the, the sort of, uh, you know, 400 minutes a day that you spend doing other things. You also, you know, drive your car and you talk to your family and, you know, that's not interesting. I'm only concerned to just talk, just talk about the news because that is the bit that matters. So what portion of that is fake? Well, on TV, there, there sort of is no fake news of the sort that we are defining here, which is this sort of deliberately uh, 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 engineered, uh, int uh, uh, intentionally disseminated falsehoods that are masquerading as legitimate news. Everything on TV is basically legitimate news, and you can argue that Fox is not legitimate, or you can argue that CNN is not legitimate, but, you know, by the sort of standards of the industry, uh, they're not, you know, Russian bots uh, masquerading as real people spreading things on Twitter. So, uh, the, 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 the big picture here on TV is that local news is actually the dominant form of news consumption. And again, if, if very few people study television, nobody studies local news, right? This is sort of the dark matter of the, uh, of the, the misinformation world, uh, is that there's a ton of people watching a ton of local news, and we in the research community have no idea what's, what's in it, right? We get occasional snippets like sort of Sinclair taking over a bunch of local affiliates and pushing their, uh, their centralized content onto them, but we're not studying that. And, and again, it's very hard to measure. Cable news comes in second, and then everything else is pretty small after that. Um, so, you know, sort of worries about like, well, you know, young people are getting all their news from, from late night comedy. That's not really true. They're actually getting most of their news from local news. Uh, in the online world, there is fake news, and you can see it now. 
because we've gotten rid of everything else. So this is the red bar up here. Uh, and again, consistent with earlier work, we find that older people are more likely to be consuming it than younger people. But for everybody, it's a tiny percentage of both their news consumption and their uh, overall consumption. So just to really put this in context, this is about 30 seconds a day, okay? So out of a 400 minute uh, overall media diet, 30 seconds of that is devoted to fake news. This is less than 10 seconds, okay? So it's like less than one tenth of 1% 1 of your overall consumption, and it's somewhere uh, in the low single digit percent of news consumption, okay? So this is sort of what those 1,100 papers are about, and uh, nobody is studying the rest of this stuff. Well, I'm sure somebody is studying it, but it's not getting uh, anywhere near the same level of attention in the media or uh, uh, in the research community. And so what I want to focus on the last minute is where should we be looking and what questions should we be asking and how can we answer them? Um, and you know, the, 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 the takeaway, I think, is we need to be looking in those large chunks. We need to be looking in the, in the, the mainstream media because we know that the mainstream media can mislead us as well in many different ways. This is a very obvious way where people cite statistics, but they don't tell you what the denominator is. They don't tell you what fraction of everything uh, is being represented here. So this is a, a way of making something seem like a big problem when perhaps it's not a big problem. They can mislead you by what they choose to cover. So this is an article from Columbia Journalism Review that my colleague and I wrote a couple of years ago. The New York Times published the same number of front page articles about Hillary Clinton's emails in the last eight days of the election campaign as they published about all of her policy in the three months leading up to the campaign. So, you know, I don't know if that's fake news, but that's certainly having an effect on readers. Um, uh, when uh, the, every major uh, cable channel and network covers uh, uh, Donald Trump's address to the nation, that's changing public opinion. Uh, the Washington Post wrote an article about the share of uh, men not having sex uh, tripling in the past decade, but the actual data is totally consistent with no change at all. Um, so uh, this, is an, uh, this example came up yesterday. It's a great example where the headline totally contradicts the content of the article. And finally, you should all read about Rupert Murdoch and his uh, attempt to uh, influence uh, elections and politicians around the world. Uh, you know, this is an old topic in media uh, communications going back to the 1970s, the agenda setting effects of, 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 of the mass media. We seem to have forgotten about that. I think we should remember. Um, Skip that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Doctor.